Hi, thanks for joining us for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. Everyone likes to see a beautiful butterfly in the garden. Today we're going to talk about attracting them. Also, thinning peaches in the spring is essential for a good harvest in the fall. That's just ahead on the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to the Family Plots. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Mary Smith. Mary is the Backyard Wildlife Center Curator at Lichterman Nature Center, and Mr. D will be joining me later. Mary, it's always good to have you here. It's great to be back. Yes, yes. So we're going to talk about attracting butterflies, right? And I know you like this topic a lot, don't of you? Of course, yeah. Butterflies are some of my favorite insects. And yes. so um, we're going to talk about some ways to attract them okay. to your yard or your balcony or um, to one of your favorite outdoor spaces. Okay, good deal. So let's start with the first question, right? So what is the difference between butterflies and moths? Okay, so we're going to get into talking about how to attract them, but I think it's important to kind of understand them a little bit first. Good. So butterflies and moths all belong to the order Lepidoptera, okay. which means scaled wings. So when you look at butterflies and moths, they're covered, their wings are covered mm -hmm. in scales. Most of the Lepidoptera are actually moths. So moths get kind of a bad rap, but there <laughs> are a lot in the United States. There's about 12,000 Lepidoptera, about 11,000 of those are moths. Wow. Um, and then the rest are butterflies. So we're not going to talk too much about moths sure, today, sure. but I just want to <laughs> point out a couple that they, um, there's a lot of them out there. Yeah, I had no idea it was that many. Yeah. yeah so that's good. That's and good. There, there are some ways that's a common question we get. How do you tell the difference between yeah. them? The more we learn, the less differences we see, right? Okay. Okay. So, but there are some general differences and some exceptions okay. to those. So the first one that most people think about is moths are active at night, butterflies yeah. are active during the daytime. There are a few daytime flying moths. Okay. Um, the clear wing, hummingbird moths, oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, those uh, are visiting flowers during the daytime, okay. but technically a moth. Second difference that a lot of people talk about is um, color. Most of the time mm. you think butterflies are more colorful, and they are. A lot of butterflies are really colorful, but there's a lot of moths that are colorful as well. I oh, didn't know that. The mm. best way to tell is actually looking at their antenna. Okay. So when you, a okay. butterfly is going to have a club-like antenna, and a moth is gonna have a feathery-like mm. antenna. Okay. And that's the best way to tell the difference. Again, there are some exceptions that you can get into, but um, for most people, seeing that difference between a moth and a butterfly. Wow. Now, one yeah. other difference that sometimes comes up is a cocoon and a chrysalis. Okay. Okay, so there is a difference. A cocoon is what a moth forms, okay. and a chrysalis is what a uh, butterfly is going to emerge from. Got it. So yeah. when we talk about butterflies, we're going to be talking about chrysalis. Okay. Which kind of leads me into the life cycle of butterflies. Okay. And that's going to be important to know because when we're trying to attract them, we can attract them at different stages. So we want to incorporate different plants along the way. Okay. So life cycle, typically eggs. And for butterflies, they're going to be laying their eggs on a host plant. A host plant is what the caterpillar is going to be eating. Got it. So we've got egg, caterpillar, then we go into the chrysalis stage, and then finally what emerges is going to be our adult butterfly. Okay. So complete okay. life cycle. Sometimes that happens in one season. Sometimes it happens over uh, two seasons. Got it. Okay. That's good. Um, and the reason is um, butterflies have to, it has to be at least like 60, 55, 60 degrees for butterflies to become active. So that's why we're not always seeing them in the wintertime. And that's why we don't see them in the wintertime. Yeah, mm. and there's different strategies that they use to survive the winter. Okay. So we've talked about monarchs before. Monarchs are gonna be migrating. There's a few other butterflies that are gonna migrate to warmer areas. Mm. Some are going to overwinter in the egg stage some overwinter in the caterpillar stage, a few overwinter in a chrysalis stage, and then there's a couple that actually overwinter as adults. One of those okay. is a morning cloak, and morning cloaks are overwintering behind tree bark, and so they're some of the first butterflies that we see sometimes in the Mid-South as early as February. The more we're learning about butterflies, we're seeing just a variety of overwintering strategies. 
How about that? All right, so what are the type of butterflies that we need to know about, right? Okay, so when we get into attracting butterflies, um, there's basically five different groups of butterflies. The first one is swallowtails. Mm -hmm. Those are the mm -hmm. big um, showy ones, mm -hmm. and they all have these little tails. Um, <laughs> and the swallowtails are interesting because a lot of them are named after their host plant. Okay. So we've got spicebush over spice by bush, you. Right. Um, spicebush is a host plant for spicebush swallowtail. Okay. Okay. I like it. Yeah, yeah. so that's an easy one. Um, Parsley, there is the black swallowtail is going to go to things in the carrot family, okay. but they'll also utilize herbs like parsley and dill and okay. fennel, um, and you can get the caterpillars on those. So those are swallowtails. swallowtails. Okay. Then we have a group called the whites and the sulfurs. Those are the, like the white, yellow, orange butterflies um, that you see, kind of medium size. Um, and those, if you are growing any sort of broccoli, mm -hmm. cauliflower, you yeah. probably encounter those probably as well. Those. Yeah. Yeah. So the cabbage those. whites. Yes. Um, but a lot of those are going to different types of legumes as well. So right. if you want to attract those, you're going to be looking at um, some legumes. Okay. Now the other group, this one is really interesting. This is gossamer wings. Yeah. And these are, they're all about the size of a nickel. Okay. And Small. a lot of them have blues um, and greens in them. But this contains one of the most interesting caterpillars um, in North America. All right, okay? let's, let's hear it. Let's okay, hear it. All right. <laughs> so we think about caterpillars, most of the time they're eating some sort of plant. All right. But there is one carnivorous caterpillar, and that's the harvester. And the harvester they, um, is a caterpillar in aphids clothing, okay? <laughs> so the okay. eggs are laid among aphids, and as the caterpillar is developing, he's actually eating those aphids. But he's disguised, so the aphids think he's one of them. Um, so that's pretty cool, though. That is pretty interesting, uh, uh, a carnivorous okay. caterpillar. Yeah. How about so, that? Yeah, so that's in the gossamer wings. Okay. And a lot of the that's gossamer cool. wings also have relationships with ants. And mm. um, just like ants can protect and harvest aphids. Yeah, um, for the honeydew. Yes. Okay. Yep. So right. the, um, some of the chrysalis and, um, have, make a squeaking sound that sounds... <laughs> you know, like an ant in distress or something, and so the ants tend to them too. What? So, How about that? I know, in, pretty interesting yeah, in the gossamer wings. Okay. Um, yeah, about that? Then we get to the brush foots. Okay. And the brush foots is kind of a catch-all for a lot of different butterflies, like our monarchs, our viceroys, um, right. and all of these actually have furry front, front legs, hmm. um, which is how they're kind of grouped together. But there are a lot of different ones, and so if you're looking to attract a specific one, you'll want to see what their specific host plants are. Got it. Um, but overall, um, the best way to attract them is to be including host plants and nectar sources. Gotcha. Okay. 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 Then the last group of butterflies I'll talk about real quick are skippers. Yeah. Skippers, there are a lot of skippers out there, and they often get overlooked, but they're named skippers because of their kind of skipping flight. Right? Okay. And they're a little bit different too. Um, they are butterflies, but they just act a little bit different, the way they hold their wings. And a lot of them, their host plants are gonna be grasses. Mm. Um, mm. Some of our native grasses, like this is inland sea oats, um, okay. and then we've got blue stem as yeah. well. Those are some of the host plants for the skippers. How about that? Okay, okay. Right. so kind of went through all the different types. Um, and. As we've talked about before, when you want to attract a certain animal, you want to think bigger than just the food. You mm -hmm. want to think habitat. Mm -hmm. So in addition to your host and nectar plants, you want to include water, okay. shelter, and then the space to raise young is going to be those host plants that you're offering for Got the it. butterflies. Got it. So um, one of the ways that you can offer water is what we have kind of set mm -hmm. up here. Butterflies don't typically go to standing water. So what they need is a wet surface. So you can do that by either getting a shallow dish. You can add sand with a little bit of water. So it's kind of like a wet sand. Okay. Um, or you can do rocks and just put a thin layer to where they can land on the rocks and get the water underneath. Um, and that's going to be one way to offer puddling areas. Puddling. And that's when they're getting water from the ground. So again, you don't have to fill this up with water, just a little bit. Just a little just bit, a little yeah. Bit. You wanna make sure there's something 
um, that the butterflies can land on, you know, above the water. Okay. The, la the other thing that butterflies need, like we talked about, it has to be so warm for them to be active. Yeah. So especially in the mornings, they're looking for a sunny spot. And you can offer that by just a big rock in the sunniest part of your yard. And a lot of times they'll visit these to warm up in the mornings. Okay. To warm up. How about that? I, feel, I like that. I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, that's a lot about butterflies and moths. I guess people just don't know. Right. Uh, and, you know, one of the things you can do is, I always think when you want to attract an animal, think like that animal. Right. Like so, animal. Okay. so if you think like a butterfly, what you're looking for is big clumps of color. So okay. you want to plant in clumps instead of kind of sporadic here and there. So planting in clumps. Yeah. And then okay. butterflies, when they are visiting nectar sources or food sources, they need a, a flower where they can land. Oh, so that means it. like a landing okay. surface. Right. And then so the asters, yeah. um, uh, cone flowers, those are all really okay. good butterfly nectar sources. And so they have the landing spot, then they can, that curly tongue called a proboscis is what they're unrolling and putting down into the plant to get the nectar. That is good, Mary. And I do want to ask you one quick question. Sure. So can we talk about just a few threats to our butterflies and moths? Absolutely. So butterflies and moths are insects. Sometimes we forget that yeah, um, because yeah. they're so we're we like them so much. But um, so any sort of insecticide, yeah. um, if it's not a specific um, target targeted yeah. pesticide, those all those insecticides are going to affect the butterflies as well. Yeah. Some other threats are um, what we all might find as an attractive plant might not be a good nectar source mm -hmm. for them. Mm -hmm. So always be thinking about what's native in your area. Mm -hmm. And then also habitat destruction, right? So we talk about this with a lot of animals, but creating these spaces for animals, if you can provide one square foot, right? One square foot is that two to four potted plants on a balcony or a sunny spot in your yard. Um, those are all gonna help um, butterflies, you know, restoring habitat, especially for the migrating ones. That's good, Mary. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's good to learn about those moths and butterflies, right? Yes. Thank you much. It is always a good idea to inspect your plant material because you never know what you may find. So as I'm sitting here looking at this clematis vine, I actually noticed an egg mass. This is an egg mass of a praying mantis. It is always good to know and maybe do some research about some of the egg masses that you see in your garden because some may be beneficial, some may not be beneficial, but the praying mantis is actually beneficial in the garden. So again, look at that egg mass. It's pretty distinct. Hopefully, we'll see what it turns into later. All right, Mr. D. Then when people fruit. see this, they're going to be like, oh, no, he didn't do that, did he? You know, Come on. thinning fruit is probably the, it's probably done the least about any okay. task other than maybe spraying. Okay. Before I get very far into uh, thinning, I want to tell you when it's too late to thin. Okay. Uh, with uh, uh, peaches or plums or nectarines, as, if the uh, pit has hardened in the center of that fruit, then it's too late to thin. Right. The size of that fruit is predetermined. You can thin all of them off but one and it's still going to be a small scrawny peach. Wow. So I'm going to show you how to check that. Be careful, don't cut yourself. Okay. <laughs> but you just take a knife or an exacto knife or just any kind of sharp knife and I go right to the center of that fruit. Oh wow. And I'm just going to cut through here. Look at that. So this is the pit. It's uh -huh. watery, it's clear, I know it's healthy, I know the freeze da didn't damage that, and I also know it's not too late to thin. And this is one of the larger peaches on this tree, so I know I'm good. I, this is an ideal time to okay. thin this peach tree. Well, that's good to know. Good to know. Didn't know that before. Uh, thinning is very, very simple. Uh, have you ever heard of good old common horse sense? I, I have. I've heard well, my grandmother say that a that, couple of times. That's probably the main ingredient in properly thinning <laughs> fruit. I've always said, and, 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 and Dr. Arlie Powell down at Auburn burned it into my brain, that if a fruit tree sets probably 90% more fruit than it needs to. Okay. 
So properly pruning is going to take some of that off and then thinning is going to take the rest of them off. This tree has already been partially thinned by Mother Nature. We have some dead fruit. Look at that right there. Okay. The little bitty yeah. ones, they're not new ones. They're dead ones that just haven't fallen off. Right. So Mother Nature took those off. So I'm not going to leave one of those thinking it's going to be a good fruit. Now let's go to this limb right here. This is a really, really good example. In this six inch span, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven peaches. Mm -hmm. Now, this is where the horse sense, the good common horse sense. <laughs> Picture in your mind how big you want a peach to be uh -huh. when, you put, when you bite into it. I'm with you. Two or three inches? Uh -huh. <laughs> How many would yeah. fit within that six inch space? Just a couple. Just a couple, right. So yeah. I'm going to oh boy, take this one off. I'm going to take this one off. Oh, they're cringing, take Mr. Take this B. one off. Uh -huh. now, 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 four to six inches, this gives this one room right. to, to grow a couple. A couple oh, of inches on each side. I'm taking those off. Okay, this limb now has three fruit on there. With no space. And you can imagine yeah. how big those fruit are uh -huh. going to be. And if you left them like they were, that would have just been like a grape cluster. Larger than grapes, yeah. but not much larger than grapes. And that's about what you want. You want between four and six inches between healthy fruit to properly thin them. Four to six. Four to six yeah. inches. All right. You want to get another one up yeah, here? let's get another one. You see a good one? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Let me pull this, this one around here a little bit. Okay, I've got two right here side by side. I'm going to kind of favor the one that's got more sunlight. So, okay, now we've got, there's one here we don't need. So we've got probably four inches here. I'm going to leave that. Okay, we've got another one up here. Actually, I'm going to take this one off, leaving the one on the upper side. So I have one here, one there, one here, and a cluster yeah, right here. Two so I'm going, right to take, yeah. I'm going to take, leave, I'm basically going to leave one. Uh, and I think I'm going to leave the one on the upper side. And there's one I didn't see. I'm taking that off. Wow. So here we have one here, one here, and one here. That's enough room. I've got a yeah. dead one. The dead ones you don't have to worry about taking off because they're going to fall off anyway. Okay. Eventually. Let's look, let's look at this one underneath it. Okay. All right. This is one little stem. It's got four peaches on it. If you had four big peaches on there, do you think that stem would hang on there? <laughs> it would not. Thunderstorm? I mean, you imagine four peaches that yeah. big. So I'm going to leave. That stem is big enough to hold one peach. Okay. So one. I'm going to leave one peach on wow. there. And I'm going to leave it kind of back close to the base because it's stronger there. Huh. That makes sense. So that you can have a big peach there instead of four little bitty scrawny ones. I'm going to do the same thing. I'll take the small mm -hmm. one off here. Well, Just go to all of them and do kind of the same thing. And you move pretty fast. You don't have to have any special tools. You don't even have to have your gloves on. <laughs> you know, so we've got two on there. This is pretty good right here. One, two, three. Yeah. Uh, that's one we just thinned, though. That's why it's pretty good. <laughs> uh, Makes sense, right? And that's got, now right here we've got kind of a cluster. So I'm going to take these two off, leave one on that little bitty stem. Uh -huh. And this was, that's three right there, this one just came off. Yeah, it was a dead one. Yeah, that dead one. one anyway, so I'm going to leave one on that little stem. Right. These dead ones are, they're falling anyway. Yeah, so Mother falling. Nature scared us to death. We thought she'd gotten all of them. I yeah. think we got, what, 18 degrees? While we had small fruit, that's it's not supposed to survive. Yeah. But it didn't stay that cold that long. Yeah. And that's our only saving grace yeah, here. I think it's what, one, one, one day, one night? Just one night. Just one night. I think you got it? I think we you got wanna, it. You wanna thin one for me? Yeah, we can do that. Let me see if you see if you were paying attention. I was paying attention. Yeah. Oh, we get, get this one. I'm going to take this one off here. Okay. Take that one off there. See, that one's right at the top. Mm -hmm. Get good sunlight. Okay. Take that one off there. There you are. There you have it. 
Good. Right. I'm impressed. You right. pay attention. Oh, I listen to you, Mr. D. You know that. <laughs> well, look, we appreciate the demonstration, Mr. D. As You're always. You're welcome. All right. If you would like to control grassy weeds next to your desirable plants, use the wipe technique. Right here we have Bermuda that's actually growing in our strawberry patch. And it's gonna be real tight to try to use a two or three gallon sprayer. So we're gonna use sponge, we're gonna use cloth here, and we're gonna use a paintbrush. And again, this is gonna be the wipe technique. So we're gonna grab our glyphosate, which does a good job controlling grassy weeds, okay? Paintbrush here, just gonna lean it over here, get some of this glyphosate, and as you can see, I am wearing gloves. That's gonna be on your label. It's always important to read that. All right. So we have some glyphosate here, and we're just gonna wipe this Bermuda Stolen, like this, okay? It's not gonna take much because glyphosate translocates, right? It's gonna control the stolen and also the rhizome. All right, so that's one technique, it's the wipe technique. The second thing you could do is you can use a piece of cloth, right? We're gonna be careful with this, sticking it a little bit. Right. Okay, got a little bit on there. Okay. And you can wipe it that way. Just be careful as you're doing this. You don't wanna to touch your desirable plants. We don't wanna harm these strawberries that are here. So that's the wipe technique using a cloth. The last thing you can use is a piece of sponge. And I actually use a sponge at home, believe it or not. All right, so we're gonna lean that over. Got a little glyphosate on there. And there's a little piece of Bermuda right there. Just wipe it on there, like that. I like that. Okay. There's also another piece of Bermuda that's creeping in here. So we'll pull that up. Look at that new growth right there. So we just grab it. Just wipe it there. And there you have it. Three different methods of the white technique. All right, Mary, here's our Q&A segment. You ready? I'm ready. These are great questions. Yeah, here's our ones. first viewer email. Can I thin my peach tree by removing blossoms or should I wait until the fruit begins to grow? And this is Susie on YouTube. So that's a good question. So Ms. Susie, I can hear Mr. D in my ear <laughs> and I know what he would say. So I'm just gonna say it, all right? That's it. So the first thing he would say is you can thin by pruning in the winter time, okay? Then he would also say, if we have a late freeze, that's gonna do some thinning for you as well. Sure. But he does suggest that you wait until you see those little baby peaches, right? When they're about an inch across, mm -hmm. then you would thin to about three fruit per 12 inch branches. Yeah, that's, that's hard for people to prune when they see the fruits. Yeah. But if you want big peaches, prune them when you see the little ones. If you want big peaches, you better do that. Give them a little space, a little right. room to grow. So exactly. again, thin to about three per 12 inches of branch and that will do it for you. Great. That'll do it. So thank you, Ms. Susie, for that question. Yeah, I think Mr. D would be proud of that. Yes. All right, so here's our next viewer email. I get raccoons on our deck in our small yard. What can I do to discourage raccoons from visiting my yard and ripping up everything? And this is thank you, Ms. Barbara. So Ms. Barbara, I'm gonna get out of the way. I'm gonna talk <laughs> to uh, Mary here. So what do you think about that one? Okay, so raccoons are really smart. They, oh they okay. really are. Um, they have pretty big brains and they mm. can figure things out. Okay. But they're coming to your yard for a reason. Uh -huh. Most of the right. time that's food. Uh -huh. So I would ask, are you um, feeding animals outside like cats or dogs? Okay. If so, remove that, especially mm -hmm. at nighttime. Um, do you, are you using bird feeders and do they have the right predator guards? Are you cleaning up oh, underneath mm -hmm. it? Mm -hmm. So the raccoon is coming there because there's some sort of food source I would suspect there. Okay. So eliminating the food source okay. and then figuring out how they're getting in and if you can do some sort of exclusion. For example, if they want to hang out under your deck or under your shed, mm -hmm. there's things you can do to exclude them from getting under there. So. Okay. Eliminate food sources and then exclusion. Exclusion. Yeah. That is good. All right, Ms. Barbara, there you have it. Good luck. <laughs> All right. Here's our next viewer email. I have extremely hard clay soil. 
what can I do to make it better? And this is Maria on YouTube. That's actually a good question. It's a great question. Right. And, and before we get started with that, so everybody wants to curse clay. Mm -hmm. Clay is not that bad because it does hold nutrients and it holds water. Right. But if you have a lot of it, it needs to be broken up, of course. So how do we do that? Compost would be my ah, first recommendation. Yeah, yeah. Um, especially if you have your own compost. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, you're going to have to amend it yeah. to get some more nutrients in there. Yeah, so I would amend it compost, uh, composted manure, mm -hmm. uh, horse or cow manure, something else I would add. Uh, humus, you know, something I would add as well, leaf litter. How about some of your cover crops, which are considered to be green manures? Uh, so like vetch, you know, your clovers, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, winter rye is something that comes to mind. Buckeye, alfalfa, you know, to help build up that soil tilth, if you will. Right. Uh, so those are the kind of things I would incorporate or amend to that clay soil, right, yeah. to get it nice and fluffy. Definitely. You know, to grow organic. whatever you need. Yep, organic material. That's I'm all what about she the needs. organic material. Yep. Yeah, so organic material, uh, Ms. Maria, that'll do it for you. Okay, so thank you for that question. Maria, that was fun. Thank you that, much that for being here. Great questions. Thanks, thank Chris. You. Thank you. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplot at wkno.org, and the mailing address is familyplot 7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. Thanks for watching. Today, we talked about attracting butterflies to your garden. We have a butterfly garden here at the Family Plot. You can go watch videos of us planting and caring for it at familyplotgarden.com. Be sure to join us next week for the Family Plot, gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe.